This is Metro Week. Our top story, the relationship between Tucson's police and its people. We'll ask the police chief how he's evaluating police relations. Then we'll ask what still needs to be done. Plus, our Journalists' Roundtable analyzes the week's news. Welcome to Metro Week. I'm Andrea Kelly. Police officers clashing with minorities have made headlines across the country this year. President Barack Obama named a task force to study the issues, and Tucson Police Chief Roberto Villasenor was part of it. We speak with Villasenor about that work. First, a look at his six years as chief and his plan to retire this year, including how the city will replace him. Five years ago, the city offered longtime police officers the chance to put aside a little more money for retirement. The arrangement differed from the state retirement system for public safety employees. In exchange, those who signed up had to agree to leave their jobs within five years. It was initiated as a cost-cutting measure. Police Chief Roberto Villasenor took the offer, so he'll leave his job by the end of December. He has worked in the department for more than three decades and became chief in 2009. To replace Villasenor, the city council is forming a committee to help a national recruiting company find a new chief. The job will be posted in August, and the committee will help interview finalists. The city expects to hire the next police chief by November, and Villasenor says he will help with that transition. Villasenor was on a national task force on increasing public trust in police departments. The group's work is complete, and I asked the police chief to explain how the group's final report will be used. It's geared towards building trust between police departments and communities, and also answering other questions such as use of force, policy and oversight training, technology, social media, and health and welfare of the officers. What are some of the specific recommendations you came up with? Well, the first one, which we felt was overarching, was that there had to be some teeth put into this report. And usually the best way to do that is through funding. And since this is offered through the, the Bureau of Justice Assistance of the COPS Office, and a lot of funding goes to local and state law enforcement agencies from that entity, that we recommended that that funding being tied to the recommendations of the task force. Now, it sounds like the president might be leaning that way, but it hasn't formally been announced yet. And what, how would you evaluate Tucson, the Tucson Police Department, doing in terms of relationships with the community and increasing that mm -hmm. public trust? I think that we do quite well, but I think that you can go to any agency in this country and you can find people that will say great things and you can find people that will say bad things. We've had some issues here, which I think probably went into some of the decision as to why I was selected with immigration enforcement and SB 1070. That caused some very di divisive times for the community between the agency and between the people you know, that we serve and, and some elements of, of the community who felt that the, the law was really targeting them. And this is exactly what I predicted when this law was first written, saying that this would divide the department from segments of the community and oftentimes that segments that are you know need us the most at times yet they would be afraid to call us and so if you talk to some of those people they'll probably say it, the relationship's not as good as it could be you talk to other people though and they'll say it's a great relationship and I think every department across the country has some of that but overall knowing both sides of the coin here I, I think that we have pretty good relationships you know the fact that we didn't have any major issues post-Ferguson and post-New York and then in several protests that we've had before, you know, with the Occupy, Occupy protests, we've never had significant major incidents and that's because we spent a lot of time building our relationships when there's no problems as opposed to waiting until after there's a problem. So you've been outspoken about the challenges that your police department and others in the state have had to deal with in enforcing the state's SB 1070, the immigration mm -hmm. enforcement law, the challenges it placed on police departments. Can you talk about what you've learned in those experiences? There have been some protests during sure. police uh, arrests or, or investigations mm -hmm. of citizenship. What did you learn in those? Oftentimes, this is a political environment and Things would be said that weren't exactly accurate, but it helped the political cause that was there. And allegations would be made that when we looked into them didn't bear out that way, or if we asked for someone to come forward to verify that allegation, the response was often, well, they don't want to. And let me because, ask you to get a little specific. Sure, what are you referencing? You know, we'd get a complaint that officers were doing something, let's say that they were working 
with Border Patrol are doing something along those lines. And we say, okay, we would like to look into that. Can you tell us what you know, where this occurred, what time? Because it would be a second party complaint. And they would often say, well, no, the person doesn't want to come forward because they're afraid that if they do, that there'll be some negative repercussion towards them. Which is what we talked about that this law would cause because victims of crime, if they don't feel comfortable enough to come forward to talk to police, then we're losing valuable information and we're creating a victim class out there that we don't want to do because then people will say, okay, well, people who look like they are potentially here illegally could be a good person to victimize because they won't call the cops. So we had issues with that that we really tried to overcome and try and establish rapport with the, the community and say that we have these things that are, are going on and, and you can come talk to us. And we had to change some of our policies and some of our procedures to make sure people felt comfortable and knew that they could either talk to us when they're a victim of a crime or report what they consider misconduct without us taking enforcement action towards them. How would you evaluate the, the progress or the, the evolution of enforcing that law, SB 1070, in the years that it's been in, in effect? Is it calming down? Is it getting easier, changing Well, at all? you know, to be honest, probably because of the sensitivity and the political leanings of Tucson, we put more emphasis on that law than other areas where it was felt this would be such a problem because they didn't have such a focused resistance to the law. And so quite often I was getting, you know, accused of things here because it's a very active community that is supportive of immigration issues here. And so we developed some very good ways of gathering statistics on what were our stops, what were the things that we were encountering, how many times were we contacting Border Patrol, how many times were Border Patrol responding, and so forth and so on. And what we discovered is that of all the times we contact Border Patrol, less than 1% of the time would they respond out to the scene. And only about half of those times would they actually take someone into custody. So when you are contacting them 18,000 times and they only come out about 100 times and only take someone in custody about 50 or 60 times, you start to realize what a waste of resources this whole thing was. Those numbers you just gave, are they annual? They're, no, I don't know, but they, they were like, I think, a 15-month period that we looked at. And in actual, they were, they were lower than we expected, which means it's a constant effort to try and regrain, retrain the officers into what they're supposed to do, because there's two provisions when SB 1070 requires officers to check on someone's status. One, when they, they stop someone legally, and they develop reasonable suspicion that they feel for some reason this person's in the country they're supposed to check. The other one is, and there's, there's caveats of what excuse you from checking, so in other words, if you provide government issued identification, um, tribal identification, there's four items that you can provide which is considered presumptive identification in that no longer do you have to pursue the investigation on national status. But if you arrest someone, and a lot of traffic offenses are criminal arrests, you know, a DUI or a suspended license, um, things of that nature, you're obligated to check with Border Patrol. And you don't get a choice in that matter. And so trying to encourage and mandate where officers need to check according to the law, we still have some officers who are not used to doing that, and we're, we're constantly saying, okay, if it fits this criteria, you have to check. And then changes came about when the president issued his executive order about what priority enforcements were for Homeland Security and, and which encompasses Border Patrol and ICE. So what we finally ended up doing was we're following the guidelines that Border Patrol is following as far as their priority enforcement. If the individuals don't meet the criteria of their priorities, which are their felons, their terrorist threats, their gang members, or they have multiple misdemeanors, they don't enforce their deportation proceedings. Well, we're following the same guidelines as to when we contact them. 
We've heard in some of the other cities that have had protests after police incidents, uh, shootings, people, deaths at police hands, mm -hmm. um, questions about the diversity of the police force. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the, the diversity makeup is of the Tucson Police Department versus the community? We're very close to the community. The one area, two areas where we could improve our African American representation and female representation. And I think every agency can improve on female representation because it's a male dominated profession still, although we've made great strides. I think we're at about 14% female right now. Obviously, we'd be closer to 50%. And African American, we're only about, I think it's two, two and a half percent, yet the population within the community is four and a half percent. All the others were very close to community population. There's more of my interview with Via Senor on our website, including how he changed the department's approach to crowd control after an incident on University Boulevard in 2014. For another perspective on the police department's effort to improve relations with residents, I interviewed Pastor Demond Holt, who meets regularly to discuss issues with the police chief. Tell me about the work you've been doing with the police department to work on police and community relations and building that trust. Um, what I'm currently doing right now, we started uh, a little on the end of uh, last year, is uh, being more proactive in our approach to uh, the importance of uh, the law enforcement community working with uh, the community of color. Um, and what I'm doing right now is uh, every quarter I'm meeting with uh, the police chief of Tucson PD and, uh, and we're discussing those uh, issues that's at hand. Uh, um, of course, the ones we've seen previously uh, with Ferguson, Baltimore, um, and other uh, cities, um, and also, um, you know, doing whatever we can to prevent uh, any of those type of uh, violent acts uh, to take place in our city. So, What do you think about the police department's efforts to kind of get out in the community and there's a coffee with a cop program and I think there are other things happening to just kind of connect with the community outside of the context of law enforcement? Um, I think that was a, a, a good start, um, but I did have my concerns because uh, the uh, relationship that needs to be really uh, dealt with and, and built upon would uh, need to be in our uh, community of color um, and other minorities uh, because of the tension right now uh, with uh, community color and law enforcement is, is, is tense, is high. Um, and so that's why I asked the chief if we could uh, take the cop and coffee program more into the trenches of our urban community, and that's where we got uh, shooting the hoops with the, the cop program. That come from off of the cop and coffee program, and that was to get law enforcement to uh, leave the retail stores um, and come down into the trenches of our community. And I felt that a lot of our kids uh, that has a bad perception um, about police officers um, are in the trenches at places like the Boys and Girls Club. And I thought the Boys and Girls Club would be a good start where we can get police officers to not just go to retail stores and coffee shops, but to come to the, a community place where a lot of our kids are at and build that, start proactively building that rapport with our children. And that's a two-way rapport. The kids it's learn about a two-way rapport. The cops, the cops it, learn about the exactly. Kids. Uh, what happens is, is that the police officer gets to see more of a personal side um, of a police officer, and uh, the police officer also gets to see more of a personal side of uh, some of our urban teens, uh, so they can not get this perception coming out the academy or whatever that everybody in the quote unquote we say hood, you know, they all bad, you know, and, and that's not the case. How would you evaluate the overall relationship between police and the minority community in Tucson? We got a lot of work to do. I think um, I don't I don't think it's super horrible um, because we do have good police officers out there. Um, I can't applaud that Tucson PD is a is a is a good strong uh, police department in our community, um, but because of the fact that people have experienced uh, police involvement from what we call bad apples on the force. It kind of uh, taint the uh, entire perception of how we look at uh, law enforcement. And so therefore, um, what we need to do is get back to the basis of policing and that's community. Um, and you just can't come into the community and enforcement role uh, just to answer calls and assume that you're going to build uh, relations, um, and, and that's not, that has not been working, and uh, this explains why our attention is, is extremely high and the perception is so negative in regards to police officers. How do you make that work? 
How do you make it work? You get back to the basis of community policing. You get police officers to get out of that general role of just coming into our neighborhoods, answering 911 calls. How do you do that? Uh, you get police officers uh, to start patrolling. Um, and uh, what we used to do, where I'm from, from Flint, Michigan, um, years ago, I think in the 90s, uh, the mayor at that time, uh, put more mini stations in urban areas. Um, and so that may be a great idea too, to be, uh, get more police officers perhaps with some buildings that have open space, office space, um, that's not too expensive or may even be free if they donated if police officers to come into our neighborhoods, set up some mini stations or some small level uh, precincts in the neighborhood. Um, and you see more of a police presence um, because you see the officers in the neighborhood, they began to start having dialogue with the, pe the neighborhood, the people in the community, and that was things like that would be the great start because now you see them on the pers personal side and the police officers is now beginning to know people more personally. So that's what we need to do to improve. Why haven't we seen some of the issues that we saw in Ferguson, New York, and Baltimore in the last year? Um, one, I think it's just, <laughs> just being blessed by God. Uh, two, I, I think... Uh, it's just we're, we haven't had it to happen, um, but we're not prone for it not to never happen. And we can't never think because uh, we have escaped it, you know, this year or last year that it can't happen year, years down the line. It only takes one incident. It only takes uh, someone of uh, color to be unarmed um, and a police officer feel threatened uh, for his life. And, you know, his, this, he discharges firearm you know, when someone is now dead. Um, that can easily change by something as simple as that. Um, but I think that it hasn't happened yet because of the fact that as well, is we do have some good officers out there, you know, that wants to go on, go on their job, do their job, and, uh, you know, go home at the end of their shift, you know. So, but again, we, st we have a lot of work to do, and the time is now to get those strategies in place. A federal appeals court says Arizona's method of teaching English language learners is okay, but that doesn't sit well with everyone. The whole idea, and it's stated in the law, was that these, it's expected that these kids would learn English after a year, um, but it hasn't turned out that way. Now our journalist roundtable. Joining me in the studio this week are Linda Valdez of the Arizona Republic, my colleague Amanda LeClaire of Arizona Public Media, and Dylan Smith of the Tucson Sentinel. Thanks to each of you for coming in this week. Now we do want to mention that right now police are investigating an officer-involved shooting on the south side near 12th and Ajo. So we don't have very much information about the details of that, but we do want to mention it because of the topic of our show. Now Amanda, you've been covering this issue of com police community relations and you've attended some town halls about the topic. Can you tell us what you learned at those or what you saw? Yeah, I went to the first town hall at the Dunbar Community Center uh, a few months ago and the issue with police was just one of the many topics um, the community was discussing. And one of the conversations was really about developing trust between kids and teens and police officers. And uh, that's something that Pastor Holt mentioned in his interview that we just saw with you, uh, that he's starting a program called Shooting Hoops with a Cop. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those, that idea took shape in some of these town halls. Um, and also something that can be forgotten in these types of uh, discussions is that police officers are people too and that the racial biases that we form in childhood can kind of carry into adulthood. Um, and, and something that we've been talking about through all of this is that these unconscious and sometimes conscious biases can be what is a part of these you know, police officer shootings that we've seen uh, throughout the U.S. and that's something that also needs to be worked on. That's a very good point. We're, we're sort of tending to talk about it as institution versus people, but it's absolutely people and people mm -hmm. all the time. Now, you also went on a ride along with Tucson Police Department this week, and it was a long, it was a long night. You were there at, at night after dark. So what did you see? This is not just a question about community relations, but just yeah. overall, what is policing like? Uh, it was a very interesting ride along. It was from about 4 p.m. to 2 a.m., and uh, I went with an officer from the Midtown Division. Uh, and we were all over the place. It was a very busy night, and a lot of what we saw was really about, uh, a lot of what I saw was the police having to uh, deal with behavioral health issues, mental health issues in the community, and a lot of people who uh, otherwise should be on medication in the system being looked afterward, and because of the state of mental health in this country, they're not and they cause disturbances and the police have to go and kind of be a babysitter for them and take them to the hospital. Uh, that's a lot of what we were doing that night. 
And when those people were going to the hospital, was it UMC, TMC, or was it the, the psychiatric facility at uh, what used to be called Keno? At Keno, yeah. That's okay. where they were being taken, yeah. So that was made to be specialty services for people who need this kind of treatment as opposed to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Did you see anything beyond drop-offs at that point? We took a couple people there, and uh, some of the other issues that, were, that happened uh, was a call about someone being mugged. Um, which ended up actually being a possibly a drug deal gone wrong. Um, and that was what we spent a lot of time doing, was kind of policing, yes, but, but also being almost a babysitter for certain communities that, you know, issues, social issues, institutional issues that need to be addressed so that the police aren't spending all of their time doing these things. As opposed to necessarily fighting crime or responding to criminal activity. Exactly, okay. yeah. And then, Linda, I wanted to follow up with you on something that the police chief said, which was that Tucson has responded differently to the enforcement of Arizona's anti-illegal immigration law, which we call to SB 1070. He said that he thinks that the response has been largely because of the politics of Tucson, that people here have been kind of watching that enforcement and keeping an eye on it more because it's a more liberal community than other parts of the state. What have you seen in other communities? Is he right? Is this a different situation than elsewhere? Well, I think it's absolutely a different situation when you consider when SB 1070 was passed, Pima County had a sheriff who said it was a national disgrace. Maricopa County had Sheriff Joe Arpaio who for the five years previous had been doing immigration sweeps that were racially profiling people. And so that really, that really colored the whole thing. SB 1070 in many ways was an expansion of what Joe Arpaio had been doing for years and years. And every politician in Maricopa County has to kiss Joe's ring in order to advance in their political career. So there was a much different atmosphere. There were some police uh, agencies. The, the Phoenix police chief opposed SB 1070. But even there, prior to SB, SB 1070, there was a lot of discussion about some of those agencies being sanctuary cities because they were not asking people questions when they when they were encountering them they, because they wanted to build trust and have a community relationship. They changed those policies before SB 1070 went into effect. So there were uh, discussions and there are still discussions about how to do things without racially profiling, but it was a it, much different atmosphere. Much, no, much no different. No protests like we saw There here. were protests, and in some of the early protests, um, Sheriff Arpaio was uh, arresting people and crowing about it. And he, he has and remains, has been and remains very popular in Maricopa County. Right. I'm going to move on to a slightly, well, a very different topic, Dylan, uh, which is the Pima County bond election that's coming up in the fall. This week, we saw the proponents coming out with the Yes on Bonds campaign and the opponents coming out with their No on the Bonds campaign. D uh, what, who's heading these efforts? Well, the, uh, the what they call the uh, taxpayers against Pima, Bo Pima Bonds, the uh, opponents of the uh, election, are... Uh, not all that well organized at this point. You know, uh, Supervisor Allie Miller is uh, sort of the uh, most vocal opponent. There are a couple of uh, conservative activists, one of whom was on the uh, Bond Advisory Committee, who started uh, th this group. But uh, they've got a, a pretty small website with not a lot of info, don't have any supporters listed on it yet, so it's kind of hard to tell how much momentum that is going to get. Whereas the uh, pro-bond campaign kicked off this week with uh, you know, trying to make a big splash with a whole slew of supporters. You know, they've got a, a long list of uh, Republicans and Democrats and people from the business community and people from uh, various nonprofit groups who are all uh, saying that we should vote yes on this. So we'll see, you know, if there's a going to be a, you know, a wider discussion on this or if the pro-bond folks are just going to steamroll through. Now, what is each side arguing? Uh, we've seen these kinds of campaigns in every bond election, but we haven't had one in a while, so what are they saying? The uh, people who are uh, opposed to it are saying it's just gonna cost too much. It's going to raise property taxes, and uh, on the uh, average home in Pima County, that would be something between 17 and $20 a year. And that's if all the... All that's each. if all seven of the uh, proposed bond packages uh, go through. It's uh, not just one vote. We're going to be voting on uh, sort of seven different slices of the bond pie. So we, some of them could pass and some of them could fail or they could all go through. Or uh, perhaps, but uh, given the history in Pima County, it seems unlikely that they would all fail.
we tend to vote for bonds in Pima County pretty regularly. And this week, Pima County also passed its budget. Uh, who voted for it and who voted against it on the Board of Supervisors? Well, uh, predictably enough, you saw a uh, party line vote with the two Republicans, uh, Ray, Car Ray Carroll and uh, Allie Miller, uh, opposed to the budget. And uh, that's another thing that's going to bump our property taxes uh, a little bit. And uh, Supervisor Miller came out with a rather misleading statement on uh, how much our property taxes will go up. She put out in her email uh, newsletter a uh, chart showing the impact on homes with uh, showing like 11 different levels of uh, impact from uh, $152,000 up to $800,000. $152,000 is the medium home price in Pima County. So she showed a whole slew of people who are have the most expensive homes in Pima County and none from the impact of the people who are, are below the, the average. Maricopa County is also looking at raising property taxes because they were also, they lost money from the state as Pima County did. And I think it's, it, it's worth noting how disingenuous it is of the legislature to pass these costs onto the counties and then the counties get the blame for raising the taxes. And when confronted with that, Governor Ducey has said, well, that's not our problem. We, we, we made our austere budget, it's up to you to make your austere budget. But I don't think that's realistic because people don't expect all their services to disappear. Pima County is trying to uh, press a suit ag against the state to say that uh, we need to uh, change this up and that it was unfair to uh, push some of these costs onto the county. So there is a possibility that uh, if Pima County wins, they could go back and change up that uh, property tax hike a little bit and uh, dial some of it back. That's what they've promised to do if yeah. they win. Yeah. Now, Linda, on the topic of Governor Ducey, he's in Mexico this week working on improving trade relations between Arizona and Mexico. Um, and this is not something that we've, we've been talking about this on the show in terms of Tucson Mayor Jonathan Rothschild doing this. Um, do you think that when the governor gets involved, it's going to shift the focus to Phoenix in this topic? Well, um, yes and no. I, I think Tucson was a leader. I'm not sure that Tucson has kept up its leadership in this, uh, on this issue. I, um, the list that the governor provided there, he's taking about three dozen people, and there are some Tucson folks. Uh, Leah Marquez Peterson from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is going. Uh, Larry Lucero from TEP is going, and I guess um, the president of the UA, um, Ann Weaver Hart, also went. And, and so Tucson is represented, but I think that. Um, when Maricopa gets involved, they're, they're big and they're powerful, and Tucson needs to make sure that it keeps its leadership on this issue. We've talked about this topic really from a theoretic standpoint. This, is, this, this could be good for Arizona. What do we know about how this will be good for economic development in the state? Well, it has the potential to be huge, and, and Arizona is, is behind. And you, that brings us back to 1070 again. We spent a lot of time earning a reputation as an anti-immigrant, anti-Mexican state, while other border states were, were improving their trade relations with Mexico. Mexico is an emerging economy. It's, it's, a, it's a middle class economy. There's a lot of money to be made there. And Arizona has not been putting the energy into it that it should. And I think that that has turned around now. So I think that's hugely important that the governor is going there and mending fences and trying to to really say, hey, we're, we're here and we want to do business with you. But just as an example, last year, Arizona's exports to Mexico increased by 22%. That sounds pretty good. New Mexico's exports to Mexico increased by 93%. And they've always been a small player compared to Arizona, but they're pushing, and Arizona has to do that too. It isn't pretty much a literal roadblock to increasing our trade in, in this state with Mexico. The fact that the ports of entry are so understaffed that it's just very difficult to actually go through. That's, that, uh, yes, that's absolutely true. That's not something true. we can control. The feds have to uh, provide for more customs officers to and, uh, do yeah, that. Our delegation needs to get busy. They have done some things, but um, yes, that's very, very true. And also another thing that Mexico has done is completed a highway across the country. Now the, the farms on the West Coast can get over to the Texas ports. 
I'm going to have to cut you off right there. Sorry, we're out of time. I want to thank you all for coming in. Um, as usual, all the stories we produce at Arizona Public Media are available on our website, including an update today about Banner University Medical Center's layoffs. Next on Arizona Week, an update on a Supreme Court decision ending a two-decade-old case challenging the state's English language learners program.